to our Torah portion today of Vayikra or Leviticus chapter 9. Vayikra or Leviticus chapter 9. Our today's Parsha is Shemini. In Hebrew, the word is Shemini, it means the eighth day. For those who are new, we we have readings that we go through each year. It's called a Torah cycle. The word Torah is the Hebrew word from which we derive the English word law in your Bibles from. And unfortunately, that is the word that's used law for the Hebrew word Torah. But what it really literally means clearly more defined in the English understanding is it's the instructions that God gave for his people, Israel, how they were to live, how they were to love him. Two tablets, remember the two tablets, the Ten Commandments? You take two tablets daily and it'll take care of all your issues in life, meet your needs, amen? amen. Two of God's tablets, his word, and we won't need all the drugs and things, huh? Hallelujah. So two tablets, our relationship with God in our relationship with one another, those are the foundational ten words from which all the statutes and ordinances and all the things come, uh, come to explain in detail and help us to further understand what all this means. So, God's instructions for Israel. Who, what about the Gentiles? Well, that's an interesting thing because Israel has always been made up of Jews and Gentiles. Those who have come into covenant relationship through the blood of Messiah. It doesn't matter if he was born from the natural as a Jew or he was born as a natural, uh, in the natural as a Gentile. If you've accepted the taunting blood of Messiah for your sacrifice, you've been grafted in to the body of Messiah. If you was a Jew and you didn't trust in him and you was lost and you repented of your sins and returned to Messiah for your salvation, then you get grafted back into your olive tree that you were in, that you got taken off of because of your disobedience in the past. If you was a Jew of a wild branch, an olive tree that could not produce fruit, and you accepted the atoning blood of Messiah, then you were grafted in contrary to nature to the olive tree of Messiah. And now we're one body, one people. We are called the house of Israel. Amen? Amen. Okay, it's that simple. It's so simple. No division that way. One people, one God, one spirit. Amen? Amen. So we're going to talk about today, the eighth day, and we're going to be talking about some things that's going to take place and how God's approached. And uh, because some people seem to think that it's just okay to do it their own way and approach God in any other way. And we're going to see from the Old Testament standard some things that took place when that happened and how God's teaching us how we're to come before Him, and we're going to also see some things about clean and unclean and what that means. And Well, Rabbi Wayne, I thought that was just Old Testament stuff. Well, we'll see about that before the day's over. You'll hang in there. We're going to uh, take this, and we're going to apply it to the Nevim, or the prophetic reading of the Half Torah, and then we're going to go to the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, and show you clearly what the apostles taught the Gentiles and the Jews about these issues of clean and unclean in the body of Messiah for all today. Okay. Now it came about, verse nine, uh, chapter 9, verse 1, that came about on Shemini on the eighth day that Moshe called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. And he said to Aaron, in other words, Moshe is calling forth the leadership of the house of Israel to talk to them to explain to them the way things need to be so that they can talk to the people too. Take for yourselves a calf, a bull for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering, both without defect, and offer them before Yodavah, the Lord. Then to the sons of Israel you shall speak, saying, Take a male goat for a sin offering, and a calf, and a lamb, both one year old without defect, for a burnt offering, and an ox, and a ram for a shalomim, or a peace offering, to sacrifice before Yodavah, the Lord, for a and a grain offering mixed with oil or a minka offering, a grain offering. For today, for today, Yodevafe shall appear to you. He's telling this is what you need to do because he's going to appear to you today. So they took what Moshe had commanded 
to the front of the tent of meeting, the Mishkan, the tabernacle in the wilderness, to the front of it. And the whole congregation came near and stood before Yodevaphe the Lord. And Moshe said, This is the thing which Yodevaphe the Lord has commanded you to do, that the glory of Yodevaphe may appear to you. How many of you want to see his glory? How many of you want to be in his presence? Oh man, I felt a little bit of it today. Hallelujah. Amen. I didn't really want to stop. Oh, hallelujah. And Moshe then said to Aaron, Come near to the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering that you may make atonement for yourselves and for the people and make the offering for the people that you may make, make atonement for them just as Yodi Bafe the Lord has commanded. So Aaron came near to the altar and slaughtered the calf of the sin offering which was for himself because the high priest had to make a sacrifice for his sins first, before the sacrifice would be made for the people's sins. How many of you know we have a high priest that's done done that today that's sitting at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly? Yeah. Hallelujah, Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. But this was a picture and type presenting of how this would be done to the people before Messiah came almost two days ago now. That's what the prophet said is the years, uh, days of a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. It's only been two days in God's time. You see to us, it's been 2,000 years, a long time. And we know that while all this is done, he's been sacrificed. That he is preparing the house for the body, the bride of Messiah. He's preparing it right now. He's gone away. He said, I go away to prepare a place for you that where I am you may be also. And if I go away to prepare a place for you, I will come back and receive you unto myself. Hallelujah. You understand? He's getting the house ready. Hallelujah. Yeah. Most of y'all have been married here. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Everyone I've married knows what I'm talking about. What they're what I'm talking about. Okay. And so, so when Aaron came near to the altar and slaughtered the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself, and Aaron's son presented the blood to him, and he dipped his finger in the blood and put some of the some on the horns of the altar and poured out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. The Bible makes it very clear: without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, no remission of sins. It's a bloody thing. Only Messiah's blood, when he came, could atone once and for all. Until that time, they were sacrificing these animals. They were going through the process. They were learning the types and shadows of what Messiah would do when he came 2,000 years ago. Now we're rehearsing as a memorial what he has done for us that we just had in the Passover service that we had. As we're counting the Omer to Shavuot, the giving of the Spirit, who indwells everyone who comes to him by faith through his atoning blood. He comes in us, he writes his Torah, begins to write his Torah and his law in our hearts and our minds. Okay? And so now, as we go through this counting of the Omer to Shavuot, or what we call Pentecost in the Greco-English term, we will head toward the fall feast. And we will practice, we will rehearse those. What's the need for? Did Messiah fulfill those? No, not completely. <coughs> he surely did not. Are we still here? Is the earthly kingdom, heavenly kingdom set up on earth yet? Is Messiah returned? No. He's coming back for his bride. He fulfilled the spring festivals to the exact day, to the exact hour. He fulfilled it perfectly. Don't you think he will do the same thing when he comes the second time? He came as Ben Joseph in Hebraic understanding, the suffering servant the first time. He comes back as Ben David, the conquering, according to Revelation as well, the conquering line of the tribe of Judah. The war of Messiah. As one guy put it to me, Mr. Dalphon, y'all know Mr. Dalphon, right? He said, he's not going to be Mr. Nice Guy when he comes back this second time. He's going to clean the clock. He's going to do judgment on this earth, just like he did in Egypt when the sons and daughters of Israel had to be released. And you know, let's sing, let God arise, and and let the people of God go free to their Messiah. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and Aaron's sons, in verse 9, presented the blood to him, and he dipped his finger in the blood and put some on the horns of the altar and poured out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar, the fat and the kidneys and the lobe of the liver of the sin offering. He then offered up in smoke on the altar just as Yodeh Bafe, the Lord, had commanded Moshe, the flesh and the skin... However, he burned with fire. However, he burned with fire outside the camp, the flesh and the skin. Where did Messiah 
hang on that tree outside the camp. Then he slaughtered the burnt offering, and Aaron's sons handed the blood to him, and he sprinkled it around on the altar. And they handed the burnt offerings to him in pieces with the head, and he offered them up in smoke on the altar. He also washed the entrails and the legs and offered them up in smoke with a burnt offering on the altar. You understand if it wasn't for Messiah, we'd still be doing this. Aren't you glad he came? <laughs> then, he then he presented the people's offering and took the goat of the sin offering, which was for the people, and slaughtered it and offered it for sin like the first. He also presented the burnt offering and he offered it according to the ordinance. Next he presented the grain offering and filled his hand with some of it and offered it up in smoke on the altar, besides the burnt offering of the morning. Then he slaughtered the ox and the ram, the sacrifice of peace offerings, Shalomim offerings, which was for the people. And Aaron's sons handed the blood to him and he sprinkled it around the altar. As for the proportions, or the portions of fat from the ox and from the ram, the fat tail and the fat covering and the kidneys and the lobe of the liver, now they placed the portions of fat on the breast, and he offered them up in smoke on the altar. But the breast and the right thigh Aaron presented as a wave offering before Yodavate the Lord, just as Moses had commanded. Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. And he stepped down after making the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Moshe and Aaron went into the tent of meeting, the Mishkan, the tabernacle. When they came out and blessed the people, the glory of Yodavah the Lord appeared to all the people. Then fire came out from before Yodavah the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the portions of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. They saw the fire of God come out and consume the sacrifice. And they shouted and fell on their faces to worship Him. Now, you want to keep that last verse in mind about how God is a consuming fire? And when things are done appropriately, it's nothing but a blessing. But when things are done inappropriately, we're going to see in this next instance that the same fire that consumed the sacrifice the same fire that was in the bush when Moses was there and it didn't consume the bush, that same fire can be a fire of judgment on the person who's disobedient. On the nations that are disobedient. Chapter 10 and verse 1. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans and after putting fire in them, placed incense on them and offered strange fire before Yodavate. Why was it strange? He had commanded them to do this. And it says, which he had not commanded them. Now let's think about this for a minute before I read the rest of this. Do you really believe for one moment that Nadab and Abihu, after seeing all this happen with the people, the fire come out, consume the sacrifice, the glory of God before the people, do you think that they're trying to dis be disobedient to God? They're trying to do some kind of strange, weird thing, mix up some kind of crazy fire and present the way they want to present it? I really don't believe that. But here's the thing. They had not been commanded to offer this fire. They took it upon themselves to do something to offer their fire before God, to offer their offering before God the way they felt that they should offer it. Do we see a pattern today? Do we see all around the world people wanting to set their own way, their own form of religious worship before God in the way they want to do it? On the Sabbaths, if you want to use that term, that they want to choose instead of the one that God chose. <coughs> the, the feast days, instead of his feast days, the spring feast of Pesach, unleavened bread, first fruits and Shavuot, Easter, and all the things that go with that. Instead of the fall feast that he prescribed, which all these are types and pictures of his bride, when he comes to betroth his bride, to be that sacrifice, to redeem his bride, to betroth her in the spring festivals. 
and we know who will come back for his bride when the house is ready and the bride has made herself ready according to Revelation. And in the spring festivals, though, where we see all, all of the world, we, it depends on what part of the world you're in. Some of the world doesn't do some of these practices we do. They do other things that may be as bad or worse. Fall festivals. Halloween. All kinds of other different kinds of things that take place instead of God's festivals. When we do that and we put those in place of and try to say that tomorrow we shall worship Yodevah the Lord by keeping Halloween, by keeping Easter, by keeping Christmas. It doesn't matter what culture you're in. Anything other than God's way, we're saying we're worshiping, we're Christianizing, we're messianicizing. I just made that up. Hallelujah. Anybody ever heard that word before? It doesn't matter. We get the point. You, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't pick on those people who just call themselves Christians. Or, you know, the reality is it's for whoever is claiming to know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob was Jewish people, non-Jewish people, Christians, Messianic, whatever. If they're not doing it God's way, and they may have zeal, they may be excited about, they really feel like they're worshiping God in the way that they feel like's right. In their heart and mind. You've got to understand this. We've got to get our minds wrapped around this. They really feel, they're getting excited about it. They're worshiping God to them. And the and Messiah himself said to the people when he was here, in vain do they worship me Teaching for doctrines the traditions of men. He said that. I didn't say it. If you don't believe it, look it up in your Bible. I didn't say it. He did. So we got to wrap our head around, does God have us? You see, it doesn't matter how we approach God. If we don't approach him through the blood of Messiah, Yeshua, in his name, then we're doing it our own way. And we're doing it as of some type of religious works. Works should come according to the Torah of God, the works of God according to His Word, after the fact that we have come through the blood of Messiah and the covenant relationship with Him. That should be what happens because of our relationship with Him, because of entering into covenant with Him through His atoning blood. Amen? So let's read what happens here again. Let's start with verse 1 again. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans, and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it, and offered strange fire before Yodivate, which he had not commanded them. What was so great about, the, about Moshe? The Bible says Moshe always did what Yodivate the Lord commanded him. We see that over and over and over again in Scripture. There was only one time that he didn't do it because he got angry with the people, and it cost him the right from entering into the promised land. He could only go up on the mountain and see it from afar. And fire, well, isn't that interesting? Only, well, ain't God kind of hard on Moses after all? Man, Moses put up with all these people out there and left Egypt. There's moaning and groaning and complaining all the time. And Moses always honored God and loved the people and wanted to stall him. And Moses did. Isn't that kind of hard? No, God was serious. In fact, he holds leadership more accountable than the people. And he knew he didn't do what God said. He let his emotions, he let his anger for the bad attitude of the people get the best of him, which allows Satan to come in and cause him to not do it the way God told him to do it. And it cost him. We need to look at our relationship with God in such a serious manner that we're so in love with him that we want to obey him. Now, you, you may be saying, well, where is grace at in this, Rabbi? Well, it's everywhere. Thank God for grace today. Grace back then, too. But this was a situation here, and today we have grace. Grace is there through the blood of Messiah when we are really trying to obey him where we're at. But when we come and to a knowledge of truth and understanding and we willfully over and over and over and over again disobey God, we are in a very serious situation. Do not go there. I don't even want to think about going there. Amen? You know when you're doing it. I don't have to tell you. The Holy Spirit's already convicted you if, if, if God's in you. And it says when they did this, that fire came out from the presence of Yode Vafe, the same fire we just saw come out and consumed the burnt offering and the people worshipped. It says, fire came out from the presence of Yodei and consumed them. 
and they died before you they bother because they did something that God had not commanded them and the people saw it and God's not going to tolerate it because they were the leadership. And then Moshe said to Aaron, it is what Yodavah spoke saying, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. I will be treated as kadosh. The Hebrew word there is kadosh. A better word for holy in English is I will be set apart. I will be treated with the utmost of respect. I am the Redeemer. I am your Creator. I am your very breath of life. You're living and breathing because of me. You're here because of me, and you will respect me. You might not respect me, Bows, but you will respect me, God says. Amen? Amen? And before all the people, before all the people, I will be honored. And when, and when, when Nadab and Abihu did not do it before the people, God's way, he was not honored. When Moses didn't do what God told him to about speaking to the rock the second time and he struck it twice, he was not honored. He was disrespected before the people. He didn't, he didn't mean to. He wasn't purposely trying to disrespect God, but he did it. You understand? So Aaron therefore kept silent. When they disobeyed God and they wasn't supposed to, and they showed this, God dealt with it before the people. And he had to set this example that this, this will not be tolerated. Moshe called also to Mishael and Elizaphon, the sons of Aaron's <coughs> uncle, Uziel, and said to them, Come forward, carry your relatives away from the front of the sanctuary to the outside of the camp. So they came forward and carried them still in their tunics to the outside of the camp, as Moshe had said. Then Moshe said to Aaron and to his sons Eleazar and Itamar, the other two sons, do not uncover your heads nor tear your clothes so that you may not die. Because these are the other two sons that would have been in their place and will be coming in their place since they are no longer here. And that he may, become, and that he may not become wrathful against all the congregation. But your kinsmen, the whole house of Israel, shall be well the burning which Yodavapha the Lord has brought about. You shall not even go out from the doorway of the tent of meeting lest you die. For Yodavapha's anointing oil is upon you. So they did according to the word of Moshe. And Yodavapha the Lord then spoke to Aaron saying, Do not drink wine. Now this is interesting because after this has happened, the creator of the universe is speaking to Aaron and he's saying to him, Aaron is the high priest. Do not drink wine or strong drink, neither you nor your sons with you, when you come into the tent of meeting. If someone said that's just uh, that's just grape juice, so why why is it, what's the problem? I've been a little funny today. Some people think that there's no no fermented wine in the Bible, it's all grape juice. And you know, and if you drink it, you're you're going to hell. Well, if you're a high priest and you're fixing to go into the temple of worship, God's saying you might better not do that because if you get a little, little uh, intoxicated, you might forget how you're supposed to come before God, and it could be a death sentence for you. And, and when we read this, and he's saying this at this point in time, we could probably get from this the possibility that maybe, just maybe, those two had a little more wine than they should have had, and they kind of got overexcited, and they did something their own way, and in their excitement, and the end result wasn't good. We don't know for sure, but it's very certainly very possible. Do not drink wine or strong drink, neither you nor your sons, when you come into the tent of meeting. In other words, when you're ministering, when you're coming into the tent of meeting. So what he's saying is that at this particular time, don't drinking, which tells me that they could drink some, as long as they wasn't becoming drunk, a drunkard. The issue with, with too much wine is drunkenness. The Bible says not to be drunk with wine wherein is what? Excess. But be ye filled with the Spirit of God. If you want to have a, a, a joyful feeling, a powerful feeling of the anointing of God, then let it be the Holy Spirit of God in you. Amen? That's all you need. You don't need to go out and get high on some drugs or alcohol because the end result of that could be jail, death, all kinds of problems and issues can come from it. Depends on how it affects a person. Okay? 
Let me read it one more time. Verse 9. Do not drink wine or strong drink, neither you nor your sons with you, when you come into the tent of meeting, in other words, in ministry, so that you may not die. It is a perpetual statute throughout your generations. And so as to make a distinction, this is very important. You may want to highlight this. The word distinction is very important today. It's very important for the congregation, the house of Israel, Jew and Gentiles, in covenant with God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through the Jewish Messiah. And so as to make a distinction between the holy and the profane, and between the unclean and the clean. Well, that's just that Old Testament stuff, ain't it? Well, we're going to see about that when we get into the New Testament today. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, the Bible says. Well, then how come we're not doing the sacrifices no more? Because they were done until they were fulfilled in Messiah. That part has been fulfilled. And he is the sacrifice. God not changed his mind about his word. There are certain parts that have been fulfilled. There are certain parts that's yet to be fulfilled. God's not changing his mind. And so as to teach the sons of Israel all the statutes, which Odebov has spoken to them through Moshe. Now, when this word term Moshe, Moses, we see even in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, and we see that how that Moses is taught, is what it says, in every synagogue in all nations throughout the world. What's it talking about on the Shabbat? Moses, we know, is referring to the Torah, the words of God. That's all it means. Don't, don't, don't get crazy with it. It's not worshiping Moses. Then Moshe spoke, and by the way, let's read it again, 11, and so as to teach the sons of Israel the statutes. What do we do here? We're here to teach God's Word, His statutes, His ordinances, the difference between the clean and the unclean, how we're to live a holy life before Him, a set-apart life, a kadosh life before Him, which only brings more blessings to us. That's all. Walking close to God only brings you more blessings. Walking in disobedience willfully or, un or unknowingly doesn't bring you the blessings. The only thing that even keeps you then is, is where His grace is in if you're, not, if, you're, if you're not walking there because you don't know until, until the knowledge comes. Then Moshe spoke to Aaron and to his surviving sons, Eleazar and Itamar, take the grain offering or the minka offering that is left over from yodi the Lord's offerings by fire, and eat it unleavened beside the altar, for it is most kadosh, most holy, most set apart. You shall eat it, moreover, in a holy place, because it is your due and your son's due, out of Yodi Bafe, the Lord's offerings by fire, for thus I have commanded. For thus I have been commanded. The, the breast of the wave offering, however, and the thigh of the offering, you may eat in a clean place, you and your sons and your daughters with you, for they have been given as your due and your son's dues out of the sacrifices of the peace offerings of the sons of Israel. All this is talking about is that the priests and the Levites and all these folks, they ate, they ate, remember the tithes for the Levites, and they ate and lived, and their families were supported by this, through these offerings. The tithe offered by lifting up, and the breast offered by waving, they shall bring along with the offerings by fire of the portions of fat to present as a Wave offering before Yodavath, hey, the Lord, so it shall be a thing perpetually do you and your sons with you, just as Yodavath, hey, the Lord, has commanded. But Moshe searched carefully for the goat of the sin offering, and behold, it had been burned up. So he was angry with Aaron's surviving sons, Eleazar and Ithamar, saying, Why did you not eat the sin offering at the holy place? For it is most holy, and he gave it to you to bear away the guilt of the congregation and to make atonement before them before Yodei Vafe the Lord. Behold, since its blood had not been brought inside into the sanctuary, you should certainly have eaten it in the sanctuary, just as I commanded. But Aaron spoke to Moshe, Behold, this very day they presented their sin offering and their burnt offering before Yodei Vafe the Lord. When things like these happened to me, if I had eaten a sin offering today, would it have been good in the sight of Yodei Bafe the Lord? So Aaron's reason and explaining the situation, and when Moses heard that, it seemed good in his sight. Now we're going to get into the song we had a little bit. We're going to get into the laws or the instructions about food, or about, we should really say, animals. Because the issue of clean and unclean comes from flesh, from animals. Chapter 11, verse 1, And Yodei Vafe spoke again to Moshe and to Aaron, saying to them, 
speak to the sons of Israel. And again, I will remind us as we go through this, it would be B'nai Israel in Hebrew, which means sons of Israel. That means, that means men and women, sons and daughters of Israel. That's what it means. And it means Jews and Gentiles. Remember who left the land of Egypt with the Hebrews? A mixed multitude, Gentiles. Amen? Amen. So it's always referring to all those who are in covenant together with the, Israel is Jews and Gentiles. We have got to relay this, articulate it by the help of the Holy Spirit to our Christian brothers and sisters. They need to understand it. Even a lot of Messianic believers don't really fully understand this. Who they really are. You know, yes, we're God's chosen. Well, those are Jewish people are God's chosen people. Yes, they are. Uh-huh. You believe, you believe Israel is God's chosen people? Well, yeah. Well, are you redeemed by the blood of Messiah? Well, yeah. Are you being granted to Oh, yeah. Well, then you're part of Israel, too. He's talking about you, too. Amen. Hallelujah. We need to understand that. Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, These are the creatures which you may eat from all the animals that are on the earth. These are the creatures that you may eat from all the animals that are on the earth. Did you read my lips? It's talking about all the animals that are on the earth. It means there's, he's going to name for you what you can eat and what you cannot eat. The God of heaven, the creator of the universe. And I know we're still thinking, well, that's Old Testament. Well, that's okay, just hold on. Because we're going to get over here to the New Testament and show you the same thing. God has not changed his mind. Whatever divides a hoof, thus making split hoofs, and choose the cud among the animals that you may that that you may eat. If it if it divides the hoof, splits the hoof, and choose the cud among animals, that's that's okay for you to eat. Does a deer does a deer have a split hoof? Does it chew the cud? Yes, you can eat it. Does a hog have a split hoof? Yes, it does. Does it chew the cud? No, but it'll chew anything and everything. <laughs> filth, the most filth that you can imagine. Gets in its flesh, and then you eat it, and you and I both know that's why you got to cook that joker extra good, because it's full of trichinosis and stuff in there that would blow your mind if you looked at it under a microscope, and you're putting that in your body, the temple of God, and you're profaning your temple. That's about as plain. I know, I made it... I'm not trying to be mean. I just want us to understand what we're doing to our temples. We are the temple of God. The Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, dwells in us today. Yes, He's in this building. Because why? We're in this building. Huh? If we want this building, would He be in this building? No, because this building is not the Mishkan and the, and, 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 and the Ark of the Covenant is not back here. And it, it's different today. We are now that temple until He comes back. Amen? So, Whatever divides a hoof, thus making split hoofs, and choose to cut among the animals that you may eat. Nevertheless, you are not to eat of these among those which chew the cud, because some of them do, and some of them have a split hoof, but they don't do both. Or among those which divide the hoof, the camel, for though it chews the cud, it does not divide the hoof. It is unclean to you. It is unclean to you. It is an animal that is not food. The reality here is what we have to understand as we walk through clean and unclean in these animals is that one is for food and sacrifice. One is not. Likewise, the rock badger, for though it chews the cud, but I'll tell you, I'm thankful for that camel. And I'll tell you how thankful you would be if you got lost over there in the desert of Sinai somewhere and there was a camel that came up that might be the only thing that saves your life because he can travel all across that desert for many days without drinking water to get you to somewhere you need to be. So all these animals play a part. God created them for a reason. And the hog, he plays a part. He wasn't created to be eaten. He was created to keep the earth cleaned up. Most of these animals and these birds that are considered unclean and were not to eat were put here. You can look at it scientifically all day long and you'll see to keep the oceans clean to keep this keep everything cleaned up and man when we when we work overtime to kill these animals and to eat them no wonder the earth's becoming more polluted we're taking away more and more of the stuff that keeps the earth clean on top of the fact that man is polluting the earth and then taking away the things that clean it up and putting them in their body we're profaning everything aren't we and we wonder why so many people are sick Likewise, a rock badger, for though it chews the cud, it does not divide the hoof, it is unclean to you. 
The rabbit also, for though it chews to cut, it does not divide the hoof. It is unclean to you. To who? To you and I who in covenant of the house of Israel with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Don't you go out here and talk to an unbeliever and tell them they shouldn't eat bacon. Don't do it. Don't tell them they shouldn't eat some hog. We're judging them when we do that. We don't have a right to do that. Judgment remains in the body of Messiah. All that we need to do is love on them and show them the shalom in our life of Messiah and the blessing of Messiah and be a witness of the fact that Yeshua died for their sins. Let the Holy Spirit deal with them through the washing of the water word that they will come to Teshuvah, repentance, and come into the house of faith and then they can learn the rest of this. Amen. Otherwise, you're going to cut most of them off by because it'll come across as condemning. It's hard enough for people of faith to even understand this today when you teach it. That's why you really got to teach it line upon line of precept upon precept because so many people in the body of Messiah today is sick because of what they're putting in their temples. And they don't even know it. And they fact, they've even been told it's okay by most preachers. And some rabbis as well. I had someone to tell me one time. Well, you know, someone very close to me, um, Rabbi so-and-so said, can I have some shrimp? Because Rabbi so-and-so said it was okay to eat shrimp. I said, well, you can have all you want, but I'm not paying for it. <laughs> I wasn't ugly. I just didn't want to be a party to having someone do something because some rabbi, you, you, do you know you can find a rabbi to tell you anything you want to hear? You can find a preacher to tell you anything. If you're looking for approval of sin in your life, something you like doing because it feels good to your flesh, I guarantee you, if you look long enough, just go ahead and get on the internet. That's the easiest way. That's what everybody's doing today anyway. They're getting in trouble all day long, getting married to people they shouldn't get married to, and they're having a disastrous life, and all kinds of craziness happening to them instead of doing it God's way. You can find someone to agree with you. But what, you, what we really need, you need to find someone who's leading you to the Word of God, not his opinion, my opinion, or your opinion. Well, let's go see what God has to say about it. Let's read his Word and see what he says. Because after it's all said and done, all that really matters is what he said. Hallelujah. Verse 7. And the pig. The pig is also referred to as the hog. In some places it's referred to as the boar. In some places it's referred to as little porky. You know, so just in case somebody's not understanding what we're saying here, in case you're from a different place and you have different terminologies. The pig, for though it divides the hoof, thus making a split hoof, it does not chew the cud. It is unclean for you. You shall not eat. Now, you know, it's interesting the reason why I, I elaborate on the shrimp thing all so much is because most people want to haul in on the hog and pretend all the other stuff's okay. But isn't it interesting how God didn't use this first? He put it on down there a ways, too. You shall not eat of their, their flesh, nor touch their carcasses. They are unclean. You let me say this before we go on. Let me tell you, before I knew the truth about this, man, I had my share of it. I did it. I sinned. All, I mean, I sinned, and I thought, I, was, and I thought it was wonderful. Man, I could eat it any way it was fixed. I'm just being honest. When I was sinning, I was sinning good. Huh? Yeah? And so when we live for God, we need to change and we need to live for God good. All the way. Amen. That's what Paul the Apostle Shaul did. Man, he was persecuting those of the, the believers of the, of the way of the falls of the Messiah with zeal. Doing it is unto God. Man, some of us have been eating that pork and, and all that stuff is unto God. Because our preachers told us and our rabbis it was okay. And I'm telling you the truth is coming now in the Word of God. And it ain't okay. Now we need to repent of that and we need to obey Him and live according to His Word with zeal the same way and hit in the direction toward God. Just like Paul when he got redeemed and he got forgiveness of his sins and he turned around. We need to do the same thing. Yeah. Verse 9. And let me tell you something. If you don't fully understand this yet, maybe you will before the day's over. And if you don't totally understand yet, you've got questions, see me afterwards. I'll do my best to guide you to what God's Word says. And here's the thing. You shouldn't do anything because I said so. You should only do it when you get a clear identification from the Word of God as we share it and the Holy Spirit convicts you and helps you to clearly understand, uh-oh, this is wrong, I need to repent and do it. 
Right. Then you do it. Amen. Don't do it until you know. Don't do it because I get emotional and make you feel a little emotional. Mm -hmm. You do it because the Holy Spirit's getting you emotional and convicting you of sin in your life. Amen. And that maybe it's causing sickness and problems in your life. Or maybe it hasn't yet, but it will if you keep it up. Amen? Now verse 9, these you may eat. See, God's not trying to just keep us from eating anything. You know? But he wants us to eat what's good for us. He wants us to eat what's going to bless us. Amen? It's just like we're all adults here. Sex. Oh, I said that word. You know, you better teach your children about sex because if you don't, the world will and it won't be God's way. You understand? God didn't create sex to cause us to just to be in a struggle. No. He created sex, first of all, for humanity to continue on. Amen. And he created it, though, to be enjoyed in a relationship that he created the way he created as a husband and a wife, a man and a woman. Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, Amen. <laughs> not Eve and Susie. Well. I don't care if I like it or not. It goes across the board the same way. Same thing with adultery. That's sin. That's a sexual sin. It's just as bad as the other way. You understand? When you do it God's way, it brings blessing in your life. It brings blessings to your ch children. And, it, it, and, it's, it, and it's awesome in God's relationship and way of doing things. Okay? Otherwise, you might end up with some disease. It can take you out like AIDS. It can take you out. Some other kind of disease. You know? So we got to... Listen, you can't go wrong obeying God. Yes. But you can go wrong disobeying God. And the only thing that has kept most of us uh, alive today is because of His mercy and His grace and His forgiveness and our repentance that we repented when we saw the truth. Amen? Amen. Chapter 9. These you may eat whatever is in the water. All that have fins and scales, those in the water, in the seas or in the rivers, you may eat. But whatever is in the seas and in the rivers that do not have fins and scales, listen to your body. Amen. <laughs> oh, thank God. So if you plan on going to Dave's catfish house when you leave here, Shame on you. if you're a believer, you're not supposed to do that. But if you don't understand yet, yeah, we'll pray for you. Amen. <laughs> But whatever is in the seas and in the rivers, that do not have fins and scales among all the teeming life of the water and among all the living creatures that are in the water. They are detestable to you. God says they're detestable. And they shall be abhorrent to you. Abominable. Did God make it any clearer? These are his words, not mine. And they shall be abhorrent to you. And you may not eat of their flesh. And their carcasses you shall detest. Their carcasses. In other words, they're dead. They're already killed. Whatever in the water does not have fins and scales is abhorrent to you. Because they are in that water to keep that water clean and pure so that the good fish that you can eat will be clean and pure. They won't have disease and all the stuff they're finding with disease and fish around and dying and stuff because of all the pollution that's in the water today. These, moreover, you shall detest among the birds. They are abhorrent not to be eaten the eagle and the vulture and the buzzard and the kite and the falcon in its kind, every raven in its kind, and the ostrich and the owl and the seagull and the hawk in its kind, and the little owl and the cormorant and the great owl and the white owl and the pelican and, and the corian vulture and the stork, the heron in its kind, and the hoopy and the bat. All the winged insects that walk on all fours are detestable to you. Yet, these you may eat among the winged insects which walk on all fours. Okay, guys, listen to what we can eat now. Because we can get us a little chocolate fondue with certain insects. And, man, we can just have us a good get-together when we go hunting or something, you know? Okay? <laughs> Yet, these you may eat among the winged insects which walk on all fours. Those which have above their feet jointed legs which jump on the earth. These of them you may eat, the locust in its kinds, the devastating locust in its kinds, and the cricket in its kinds, and the grasshopper in its kinds. So, man, we can go out there and get some of them great big old nice juicy grasshoppers, get us some crickets, and we can get us a little chocolate fondue and dip them juggers in there and crunch on them, and it's okay. 
Hillary Clinton. And I'll tell you, honestly, if you was in a situation that's all you had, it'd start looking real good. It'd be good that you could eat it. But all other winged insects which are four-footed are detestable. No other, no other insects are detestable. By these, moreover, you will be made unclean. Whoever touches their carcasses becomes unclean until evening. And whoever picks up any of their carcasses shall wash his clothes and be unclean in the evening. Concerning all that, God's concerned about disease. He doesn't want us to become sick and contaminated and diseased. Because see, all these animals that are, are unclean to eat, and these birds and things, they clean up the earth, they take disease into their bodies so that it won't be left on the earth where someone else or something else can catch that disease. He's so awesome. God has thought of everything. He is so awesome in the way he has created all of humanity and all the animal kingdom and all how it all works together in union. It's man that is corrupted and corrupt, corrupted getting all. Concerning all the animals which divide the hoof do not make and do but do not make a split hoof of which do not chew the cud, they are unclean to you, and whoever touches them becomes unclean. Also whatever walks on its paws among all the creatures that walk on all fours are unclean to you. Whoever touches their carcasses becomes unclean even uh, until evening. And the one who picks up their carcasses shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. They are unclean to you. Now these are to you the unclean among the swarming things which swarm on the earth, the mole, the mouse, the great lizard in its kind, and the geico and the crocodile and the lizard and the sand reptile and the chameleon. No more alligator, folks. No more lizard, Bondu. These are to you the unclean among all the swarming things. Whoever touches them when they are dead becomes unclean until evening. Also, anything on which one of them may fall when they are dead becomes unclean, including any wooden article or clothing or skin or sack. Any article of which use is made, it shall be put in the water and be unclean until evening. Then it becomes clean. You've got to wash it and clean it up. As for any earthenware vessel into which one of these may fall, whatever is in it becomes unclean, and you shall break the vessel. Now, what this was talking about back in those days, is a lot of the clay vessels they you know they they were not fired and they were not coated inside and out so if the contamination fell in there it would get into the clay and you was to break the vessel because there was really no way no way to get the bacteria or wash it wash it out so you were to to break it throw it away any other food which may be eaten of which water comes shall be unclean and any liquid which may be drunk in a, in every vessel shall become unclean Everything, moreover, on which part of their carcass may fall becomes unclean. An oven or a stone, and that's not talking about an oven like we have today, but it's talking about a stone or something that contamination gets into it that was used like a flat, hard stone, uh, shall be smashed. They are unclean and shall continue as unclean to you. Like a wooden spoon, the same thing will happen to a wooden spoon. We have to be careful. You ladies know what I'm talking about. We use these wooden spoons. And we use them over and over again, and we wash them, and we're mixing meat up, good clean meat and all that. But we have to be careful. Bacteria can get into that even after we wash it, and we don't realize it, and we can get sick from that. However, our stainless steel stuff that we clean up, and you know, it won't get inside that, and we can clean it, wash it, and so it won't be fine. It's like, just like uh, one of the things I warn a lot of people when I'm building their houses for them, they want all this uh, granite and stuff, beautiful granite, you know? The, the problem with granite is, is that it's porous. And you got to seal it really good, and you got to clean it really good, and you got to be careful. You go cut meat on that granite, you know, when it gets down in a little, the little porous areas, you can't see it. You think you wiped it off good, and it begins to get bacteria in it, and you cut in there again the next week or something. You have to be careful with stuff like that. You know, God is serious. God, you know, God in all His infinite wisdom, He knew all this stuff before that man kind of even knew it back then, Amen. and so He was doing all this for their good. He does everything He does for our good. You know, and we, and we disregard all this and think we're smarter than God and all that. That's how we get ourselves into so much trouble. Nevertheless, a spring or a cistern collecting water shall be clean. Though the one touches their carcass shall be unclean. Why would a spring or cistern cause running water could flows, continues to flow and cleans itself out? And if a part of their carcass falls on any seed for sowing which is to be sown, it is clean. Though if water is put on the seed and a part of their carcass falls on it, it is unclean to you. Also, if one of the animals dies with which you have for food, the one who touches its carcass becomes unclean till evening. 
He too who eats some of its carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. And the one who picks up its carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean to evening. Uh, now, you know, today in the society we live in, we have all, man, we just, we got our bathtubs and hot water and all this. Well, they're out in the desert, you know, and, and, they, and they didn't quite have the cleaning facilities. It's a lot easier for us to get something that's not right cleaned up quickly. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, every swarming thing that swarms on the earth is detestable, not to be eaten. Whatever crawls on its belly, snakes, and whatever walks on all fours, Whatever, I told my little Snooky this morning when I, I said, Snooky, you're safe here in God's kingdom's house. <laughs> but you better be careful where some other places, because some places a dog ain't safe. Seriously. Whatever crawls on its belly and whatever walks on all fours, whatever has many feet in respect to every swarming thing that swarms on the earth, you shall not eat them, for they are detestable. Do not render yourselves detestable through any of the swarming things that swarm, and you shall not make yourselves unclean with them so that you become unclean. For I am Yodeh the Lord your Elohim, your God. Consecrate yourselves therefore and be set apart. Be holy. Kadosh. For I am set apart. I am holy and I am Kadosh. That's what he says. And you shall not make yourselves unclean with any of the swarming things that swarm on the earth. For I am Yodeh the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God, your Elohim, thus you shall be holy. Kadosh set apart, for I am holy. Kadosh set apart. He's telling us we're to be Kadosh set apart just like he is, our father. Don't you fathers and mothers want to train your children to be good? Fathers and mothers set apart, Kadosh, keep themselves clean, keep themselves pure. Our father wants us to be the same way, just like him. And if he told us that we're to be like him, don't you think that he may make it possible for us to be like him? Sure. Through the blood of the Messiah, through obedience to the Word of God. We've got mercy and grace when we fall short. This is the law, the Torah, the instructions that God gave regarding, and this is really the reality of it, the instructions that God gave regarding the animal and the bird and every living thing that moves in the waters and everything that swarms on the earth. To make... A distinction between the unclean and the clean. And between the edible creature, listen to this, underline this, highlight this. The edible creature, in other words, the creature that you can eat, it's okay. And the creature which is not to be eaten, the unedible creature. So God says there are creatures that are made to be eaten, even used in sacrifices at that time in eating, and those that could not be eaten. He had other purposes for them. And so, what we have to do, and we're going to move over. I'm going to, I'm going to skip the. Uh, I'm going to go straight to the Brit Hadashi reading first, uh, over here in Acts 10. If you're going to be turning there, uh, and we'll take a short break in a few minutes. But I want to do this before we do our final, our final reading uh, in the half tour of Second Samuel. Uh, I want to make sure we get this in. So the only thing that we can do in this case is we are going to have to manipulate God's word. Are we going to have to prove from God's word that God changed his mind after Yeshua came and he became that final sacrifice to be able to say it's okay to now eat what he's already said that it's an abomination to eat? We've got to figure out how to do that. Now some of the folks have figured, think they have figured it out theologically and they have taught what we're fixing to read that's taught in Bible colleges every day all day long. They have figured out how to manipulate how Messiah changed his mind about this, and it's okay just to eat anything. And I want you to think about this when we're going to be talking about this in just a moment. If it's okay to eat anything and everything, then why don't you go down there to the Amazon jungle and get you some of the real beautiful colored frogs and eat them. You're going to live about a few minutes. Some of them are very toxic. And that's one of them things you ain't supposed to eat is frogs. So God's covering a multitude of things when he tells you not to eat those frogs. Because some of them won't kill you, but they may bring disease to your body. It might kill you down the road if you eat enough of them. You know, come on now, some of us guys that were being rednecks when we were young, we went, we went frog gigging, didn't we, huh? Them frog legs, y'all know what I'm talking about. You know, well, we didn't know no better. We just thought we was doing all right. You know, we were deceived, but we didn't know it. What does the Bible say? The devil's gone through the world. What to deceive the whole world? He's done a good job. All right, so let's go to Acts. 
Acts chapter 10. And then we'll take a little short break. Because we're going to get, I'm going to give you the scriptures and the places today where theological teaching, where you go get your, your, uh, your, all your degrees, your associate's degrees, your bachelor's degrees, your master's degrees, your doctors of theology degrees are going to teach you this from these scriptures right here. How did this okay in God changed his mind? Well, let's see if that's what it really says or not, okay? Acts 10.9 is where we're going to start. Acts 10.9. Actually, I'm going to back up and add a little bit to it so you get a little bit of the understanding. In fact, let's go on up to verse 1. I will leave it out. Now, there was a certain man named, uh, at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort. He was a Roman uh, officer, if you will, a man of authority. He was, uh, he was a centurion. And he was a devout man and one who feared God, but he was not just any Gentile Roman. He was a God-fearing Gentile Roman. He believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen? Uh, with all his household, and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. He was a man that prayed to God. And he was a man that loved the Jewish people that they were over, that they had... You know, the Romans was in charge of Israel at that time. When this was being given, the Rome had control of the Holy Land. And he was there. Just like America goes to different places and we set our, mil we set our military up and we got our generals and all these people in charge over there uh, in that land. We're occupying it for a period of time to help get it in order. We don't go to occupy, but Rome occupied the Holy Land. About the ninth hour of the day, clearly, he saw in a vision an angel of God, of Elohim, who had just come to him and said to him, Cornelius. Cornelius was serious as a Gentile with his relationship with God. And he was praying continually. He was giving to the Jewish people. And he was seeking God's face about how to live for him. And fixing his gaze upon him, and God sent this angel. And fixing his gaze upon him and being much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. This angel said, listen, God's paying attention to you. It's ascended. You know what we do? We pray. Our prayers is as incense. They ascend before God. That's how, that's how we're getting incense today. Not like they did in the temple back then. Our prayers is as incense before God. And now dispatch some men to Joppa and send a man named Simon, who is also, uh, and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter, our Shimon Kepha. He is staying with a certain tanner named uh, Shimon or, si or Simon, whose house is by the sea. And when the angel was speaking to him, and when the angel who was speaking with him had departed, he summoned two of his servants, a devout soldier of those who were in constant attendance upon him. And after he explained, had explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So who's he sending? Three people to Joppa. To where Peter's at, looking for Peter. Cornelius, a Gentile. That's what's happening. So we understand. Because we understand, we've studied the Bible for any length of time, that Cornelius is basically the first convert. The Gentile convert. Okay? And on the next day, as they were on their way, and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. That's noontime. About noontime, while they're getting something, uh, ready to eat, he's up there praying. And on the next day, these three guys who are on their way to that city, Peter is going up and he's praying. This is what it says happened. And he, and he became hungry and was desiring to eat, but while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance while he was praying, or a vision. And he beheld the sky opened, and a certain object like a great sheet coming down lowered by four corners to the ground. Perhaps a tallit, four corners. But this is interesting. Because we look at it as a tallit is something that's holy. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. And the voice came to him. A voice came to him. Arise, Peter, kill and eat. This is interesting because these are unclean. Okay, and yet this voice... 
It's speaking to him. Someone said, well, that must have been the devil. No, I don't think it was. Let's read on. Let's see why I say that. Verse 14, But Peter said, Keep us said, By no means, I, the Lord, for I have never eaten anything, listen to this, unholy and unclean. Do you think Peter understood the difference this Jewish apostle understood, the difference between clean and unclean? Of course he did. He just said so. And he's never disobeyed the commandment. And he walked with Messiah when he was alive on the earth. Okay? And this is a long time, a pretty good time after Messiah's death. Because up to this point in time, all the believers were Hebrew believers. Okay? And now we got Gentiles praying to God by faith. It says, And again a voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. So we got this sheet and got all these unclean animals in them, and they're letting down. And now he's telling Peter for the second time, whatever God, that's why I say this is God talking, because God's saying what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. So, and this happened three times. Verse 16, and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. Happened three times. Now, first of all, we got the number three here. Ooh, hallelujah. So there's a wonderful picture fixing to take place. A picture not only of Messiah, but of resurrection and life from impending death, from, from things that, we, that Peter's been walking in error on to bring in correction. Because this dream given to Peter, as we're going to see, was not a dream because Peter was so holy. Peter still had some issues, and we're going to see what these issues were in just a moment. And there's people within the Jewish community today that still got issues in the same regard that we're going to be talking about here. <coughs> and there's Gentiles got issues too. Okay? Now when Peter was greatly, now while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be, so Peter's had this vision, he's seen this sheet come down three times, and he said, I'm not going to eat this, it's not, no Lord, I've never eaten, I've never disobeyed your word. He's perplexed because he's thinking, my goodness, this I, I, what does this really mean here because I know what God's word says. So he says, Behold, the men. Let me, read back, let me start reading on 17. Now, while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked direction for Simon's house, appeared at the gate. You think God had it timed out just right? He gave him the vision over there, sent the men, and then Peter goes up and prays. And they're on the way. After he gets through praying and has a vision, three of them knocking on the door. Three Gentiles. Now let me explain something to you. If you don't know it, you need to understand it. Gentiles, the Jewish people, then, and even in some cases today, shouldn't be. But for those guys, and Peter, you got to understand that Peter was a Messianic Jew. He was a believer in the Jewish Messiah. And we know God's Word clearly teaches that we should have no partiality for anyone because it's sin. But to them, to the Jewish people, Gentiles were considered as dogs, unclean, dirty dogs. They did not want to be called dead in their house, nor did they want them in their house. And Peter was still dealing with this issue, and God's fixing to correct the issue. And calling out, they were asking whether Simon, those Gentiles who were there knocking at the gate, who was also called Keith or, or Peter was staying there. And while Peter was reflecting on the vision, the Spirit said to him, who said to him? The Spirit of God is saying to him. While he's reflecting and asking God, meditating on what this means. Behold, three men are looking for you, Peter. Three men. She came down three times. Representing these three men who Peter was considered unclean. Three dogs. But arise, go downstairs and accompany them without misgivings. For I have sent them myself. God saying to him, no longer call what I call what, unclean, what I cleanse. Because why? We're going to find out he's cleansing the Gentiles too. They come into faith. He said, no longer call them unclean. And you go down there and you go with them. Do whatever you need to do. I'm telling you right now, I'm speaking to you by my spirit to do it. Because I sent them personally, myself to you. I sent an angel over to Cornelius' house 
and told him what to do. <laughs> Glory to God. Is anybody getting this? Amen. Amen. I mean, God is so awesome. He's so crystal clear in how he sent this and how he's worked it all out. There can't be no question about it Amen. if we read the whole text. And Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for which you have come? And they said, Cornelius a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by Kadosh Angel, a holy angel, to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. They want him to know who they are and why they're there and all that. And we're supposed to come get you and you're supposed to tell us something. God said that you're going to teach us something about his word. Now here it is, Gentiles come to faith in the Messiah, but they need a Jewish man who knows the word of God to teach them the rest of the story, to teach them the ways of Moses, if you would, Moses' word, which is God's word. And so he invited them in and gave them lodging. He would have never done that before. He never would have. And on the next day he arose. I'm going to read more notes up there. And on the next day he arose and went away with them, and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. So Peter went, and some of his brethren went with him. Some of his Jewish brothers went with him. Some of those Hebrews. And on the following day he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was awaiting for them, and he called together his relatives and close friends. Now Cornelius is excited. He's already called a bunch of his relatives and his close friends together. And when it came about that Peter entered... Cornelius met him. You see, Cornelius is a man of faith, Brother Allen. He knows God doesn't send an angel, and he wants to have as many people there as he can because he believes God is going to move. Hallelujah. He believes he's going to move. Do you believe he's going to move today? I do. I believe he'll move in your life and meet every need that you have right where you're at, no matter what it is, if you're looking for him, if you're praying, send up incense through your prayers and seeking his face. And when it came about that Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell on his feet and worshipped him. But Peter raised him up saying, Stand up, I too am just a man. A real man of God, when you fall down at his feet, he'll stand you up quickly. He don't want you going there. He's all on. You don't, no, I'm a man just like you. We're here to learn and to worship God together. Amen? And as he talked with him, he entered and found many people assembled. Oh, well, he already had a whole congregation there, brother. Jason, all assembled together. The ecclesia was there. That's what ecclesia means. It don't mean church. It means the assembly. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. Now let me stop and talk to you about what Peter's really saying here. Does the Bible say it's unlawful for him to do that? No. But, but, the Judaism, the extracurricular things within Judaism had taught that it was. We know that's not what God's Word ever taught. He says, he says it's a sin to show partiality to anybody. It's a sin. So what Peter's really saying is, in what he had been taught, the part of Judaism that was still never in him was that this is what it taught. For it's unlawful for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And the Torah does speak about that in certain contexts within the Torah about a foreigner and how it relates in certain situations. So some of us in the Torah, some of us not. Let me make myself clear on that. So I don't want nobody to be getting me after the service and say, Rabbi, why do you say so and so about a foreigner in the Bible? You know, I understand what it says in there, okay? And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy and unclean. God showed him. That is why I came, and, and you know, when God showed him this, in this vision, was he giving him something new and going against his word? No, it's right in the Torah. The guys did not show partiality to anybody. So God wasn't showing him something new. He was just showing him something that he wasn't practicing properly. That he was showing partiality between different peoples. And you know what? Christianity, the Messianic movement, people do it to each other all the time and we got to quit doing it. we got to love everybody according to God's way of love. That is why I came without even raising any objection when I sent for you. And so I asked for what reason you have sent for me. And Cornelius said, four days ago to this hour, I was praying in my house during the ninth hour. The ninth hour, four, 3 to 4 p.m. And behold, a man stood before me in shining garments. Talking about Amalek, an angel. 
And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before Elohim, before God, your deeds of charity. Send therefore to Joppa and invite Shimon, Kepha, or Simon Peter, who is also called Peter, to come to you. He is staying at the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. And so I immediately sent, and so I sent to you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. Now then, we are all here present before God to hear all that you have been commanded by Adonai the Lord. So what we're talking about this today, where people are, many people are confused in this issue about what's food and not what's food and how, you know, we disrespect different people if they don't fit in our category and all that. We're hearing, we're hearing the same message, aren't we? That we all love one another. We're all to accept one another. And, and we're all to be part of the kingdom of God together. Uh, and opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. All right, go to Deuteronomy 10, 17, just real quick, just so you'll know I'm not just making this up. Deuteronomy 10, 17, Torah. God had to remind Peter what was in Torah because he hadn't been living, he hadn't been acting like it. He'd been showing partiality. He'd been going along with the rest of his Jewish brethren who wasn't doing right. 10, 17. For Yodei Bafei, your Elohim, the Lord your God, is the Elohim, the God of gods, and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. Right there. God had to send an angel to remind Peter, you got a line, Peter, you're getting straightened out. And he used unclean animals to do it. It had nothing to do with eating unclean animals. Nothing whatsoever at all. It had to do with accepting the people of the nations of the Gentiles who were coming to faith, accepting them and not showing partiality. But in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. For the sake of time, I do want to go back to Acts 10 because a couple of men point some out to me and probably should read another verse or two here real quick. Acts 10, <clears throat> Acts chapter 10, I, I think I ended up with verse 34, 35, but let me just start at 34 again and read a couple of verses here. <coughs> Acts 10, 34, and opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, now let's, let's pay close attention to this word nation. Nation is Goyim, Gentiles. Okay? So every nation, everybody's included here. Not just house of it, not just Israel, not just Judah, but everybody who becomes a part of Israel and every nation wherever they're at. But in every nation, the man who fears him, who fears who God, and does what is right, obeys him, is welcome to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, and Israel, preaching shalom, peace. In other words, the good news through Yeshua the Messiah. That who is Yeshua the Messiah? He is Adonai of all. He is Lord of all. That is the gospel that Yeshua is Lord. For the Gentile and the Jew, making the two into one, breaking down the partition wall, making the two one new man. This congregation is a one new man congregation where Jew and Gentile worships together. Now, just briefly over here to Samuel real quick, I'll just say a few things. I'm not going to read the whole text. The second Samuel <clears throat> talks about the peril of moving the ark. David, King David, wanted to move the ark to uh, the place in uh, Jerusalem, to the tent that he had built for it, and they had a little situation where they put it on that it says uh, several times, to move, the, to move the Ark of the Covenant, they put on a new cart. N-E-W. New cart. Is that what the Bible t tells them how they're to move the Ark? No. So, anyway, ultimately in this, another good-meaning, well-meaning person that they've been you. Uh, the oxen stumbled a little bit. The Ark shook, and he tried to grab it and make sure it didn't fall. He was trying to do good, right? He was really trying to do good, right? But the whole process was all wrong. And God struck him with fire, struck him down. David was very upset about it. So we know the stories we go through this. That we see again a situation of trying to do things out of God's order is not good. And also, actually, if you want to carry this back to Rashid or Genesis, uh, we see in the very beginning that uh, uh, Cain and Abel, 
in the sacrifices. We see the same thing in Cain and Abel, just like the two sons of Aaron in the sacrifice and in and going into the temple and offering strange fire that God had not commanded that uh Abel gave a proper sacrifice according to God's way. How did he know? Adam told him, his dad. How did Adam know God told him? When he had, he had to provide the first sacrifice when they sinned in the garden. There's no other way but to understand it. They were taught this was passed down. Well, a, uh, Cain, he didn't give a proper sacrifice. And, and, and God said to him, Cain, why are you so sad? Don't you know if you do what's right? God gave him a chance to do what was right. It'll all be well with you too. But instead of him doing what's right, he went out, he was ticked off, and he murdered his brother. So you see, obedience to God is better than all the sacrifices and things that we can do. We should give our offerings or our gifts or sacrifices because that's part of the deal. But if you think that's enough by itself, obedience is better. Amen. Doing things God's way is important, and then we're supposed to do the rest. Amen?